Hey, well, hello, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this Live with Scientists panel event. So before we get started, there will shortly be a poll appearing on your screens with some questions about participation in scientific research. If you could just spend a minute or so answering those as best as you can, that would be great. Thank you. And we should be able to see the results in just a minute. So once again, uh, welcome to this panel event. This month, Live with Scientists are celebrating our first anniversary with the theme, Science is for Everyone. And what better way to celebrate this than by focusing on the wonderful impact the public can have on research with our panel discussion, Research and You, Why Science Needs You. So I'm absolutely thrilled to be joined by four scientists whose research has truly benefited from public input. And over the next hour, after introducing our panel, I'll be putting some of our questions to each of our speakers to find out more about their work, how members of the public have got involved and how this has benefited their research. So please submit questions using the Zoom chat function as we go along. Subtitles will be available using Zoom's live transcript function, which should be available at the bottom of your screen. And this event will also be live streamed to our YouTube and Facebook page. And at the end, after our panelists have given their closing thoughts, we'll invite you to answer the same poll questions again to see how views may have changed. So without the further ado, I'm absolutely thrilled to introduce our fantastic speakers for this evening. Our first panel member is Professor Sheena Krukchenk. So Sheena is an immunologist within the Lydia Becker Institute while also being a Leshner Fellow in Public Engagement and the University of Manchester's academic lead for public engagement with research. Sheena has headed up several engagement projects such as the Worm Wagon, which you'll hear all about. Sheena has also led the Britain Breathing Science Project using an app to track asthma and allergy symptoms. So looking forward to hearing all about that as well. Next, we have Dr. Binish Khartoun, who is a research associate in the Christie Patient-Centered Research Team and the University of Manchester. Binish has a strong interest in health inequalities and an involvement of more diverse populations in medical research, particularly relating to cultural and language barriers. So we can look forward to hearing all about how a one-size-fits-all model is failing medical research. Next, we have Dr. Suzanne Johnson, who is a lecturer in transformative oncology. Suzanne's research interests have focused on communication between normal and cancerous cells and the tumor microenvironment. And Suzanne is also the Division of Cancer Sciences Lead for Social Responsibility and works closely with researchers to engage the public and patients in cancer research. So we'll hear all about Suza's collaboration with the BAME Advisory Group to address cancer disparities in care and in treatment. And finally, we have Dr. Ellen Polyakov, who is a senior lecturer in the Division of Neuroscience and Experimental Psychology and co-director of the Body, Eyes and Movement, or BEAM Lab. Ellen's research focuses on the overlap between cognition and motor processes with a particular focus on Parkinson's disease. Ellen is also her divisional lead for social responsibility and has led a number of engagement projects we'll hear all about from science art masterclasses, um, dance workshops for Parkinson's, uh, and we'll also hear about the role patient and public involvement has played in Ellen's research and her papers that she's co-authored co with artists and people with Parkinson's disease. So welcome to our four panelists and thank you so much for joining us tonight.
Bang. What about um, Britain breathing? Could you tell us anything about that and how the data from that might have informed research? Uh, well, the, the, it is a research project in of itself. Um, that really emerged from the work I was doing with these, these non-native English speakers. So by this point, I was, um, I, I'd been working creating English lessons to teach about infection to teach about immunology, to teach about vaccines with, um, I, you do it through ESOL courses, English for speakers of other language. So I partnered up with an English teacher to do that. And the thing that they kept asking me was, why do I have allergies? I, I never had allergies when I lived in whatever country it was. I moved to the UK and I have allergies and I'm really cross about it. So. I started to talk to them about that and introduce the ideas of what we understand about allergies. But I was asking those questions myself and my son suddenly got asthma, my eldest son. And that's not something that runs in my family. And it was like, what is going on? So I spoke with a whole team of kind of cross-disciplinary researchers. Um, and we started wondering about what we could do. We were working with the British Society for Immunology and the Royal Society of Biology, which was brilliant having their input. And um, we borrowed from all sorts of disciplines. And it was all to ask this question or answer the question, why do people get more allergies? Um, so it was a lot of fun setting up again. The English teacher came and helped with the co-design workshops so that we could be more inclusive. That kind of stayed with me. And we published our first research paper from a few years ago now, and we're just in the process of doing the next iteration. So it's led to further grant funding, but it's also we're just writing up another batch of papers. It's taken us a while to work out the best way to analyze the data, but it's really exciting to see what's coming out about what is triggering changes in allergy and asthma symptoms. So yeah, it's been exciting great people to work with. Yeah, it sounds amazing. It sounds like something that would definitely affect a lot of people. So I'm definitely not surprised that so many people are interested in that. Yeah, yeah thank you. It's really great to hear such like fantastic and exciting examples of uh, participation in research. So uh, so I guess leading on from that, uh, Binish, if we come to you next. Um, so is there a problem in general with uh, diversity in uh, research participation? And if so, uh, why is that? And what are the main barriers? So yeah, there is a problem. There's a problem because there's underrepresentation of people from diverse backgrounds in research. And the reasons for this um, are complex and they could be down to hesitancy on the part of participants or lack of inclusion by healthcare uh, staff or researchers and other socioeconomic factors and rooted structural inequalities as well. But then separately and then collectively as well, these result in a range of outcomes from non-participation to exclusion, mostly unintentional, but sometimes I'd say by design as well, because of sometimes we, we, we look at our inclusion exclusion criteria, and straight away you can see that a lot of the, uh, for example, Black, Asian, minority, ethnic populations, I hate saying BAME by the way, um, would not be included uh, because they can't speak English, for example. Um, some of the main barriers I'd say are down to language challenges, so uh, and also low research awareness as well, or mistrust in research. 
Uh, there's a lot of stigma attached to um, taking part in research. Uh, there are communities who believe that their lives might not be as valued. So taking part in any type of research that they don't understand is actually uh, seen as dangerous uh, for them. Uh, cultural values and beliefs as well, what the family might believe in. Um, and again, you know, having that mistrust uh, doesn't help as well. And then from the researcher's point of view, I feel as if we're not engaging as well with these um, communities. Uh, and I think most of the times we do think about the time it might take, the costs, and then just sort of shut the ideas down and just stick to the easy option, which is including uh, you know, English speaking participants. So, uh, you know, I'll give you some statistics and this is, uh, this will be a bit of a shock for some. So if, 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 all, if all our participant information sheets, which is what we give out to participants when we're starting research, if they were all in English, then it would mean that British uh, uh, Bangladeshi women and Pakistani women, 44% Bangladeshi women and 31% Pakistani women aged over 65 would not be able to take part because they wouldn't understand it. So that's a huge statistics in itself. And I just feel that's just the tip of the iceberg. You know, there's so many issues, but um, yeah, definitely looking at different things like translators, interpreters, and, you know, just tweaking certain things and tailoring your approach to recruitment uh, could help. Mm, yeah, definitely. That's really shocking to hear. So, I mean, I guess you kind of answered this and um, what more researchers can do to ensure more diverse population, I suppose, you know, use, like you said, using interpreters and making sure non-English speakers or readers can access these participant uh, information. Is there anything else that researchers can do to sort of encourage more diverse populations um, while considering yes. and avoiding, like you say, a blanket BAME approach? So, mm -hmm. Yeah, so most researchers I feel um, and research that I've been part of as well, look at ethnic minorities, for example, as a homogenous group. So, for example, I use the word BAME, BME, and we're easy to put people in this group and not try to understand all the different cultures, all the different uh, sort of communities, in, you know, included in this. So, for, for example, um, so I'm South Asian, so saying that me being Pakistani and my friend being Bangladeshi and somebody of Indian origin are all experiencing the same sort of things, would have the same attitude. And I just think it's not right because it's not it's not the truth. We've got different cultures, we've got different beliefs. You know, we, we, we're we all, you know, kind of have these uh, social, social categories such as race, ethnicity, gender, and not just within the BAME communities, you know, Overall, a person has different social categories which make up their social identity. And, you know, trying to understand those sort of intersects, what we call intersectionality now, um, in, and how they sort of, uh, you know, exist um, simultaneously is, is really, really important for researchers. And I'd say one, one of my first sort of advice would be that look in look within your team you know what is the diversity between within your team are there people on your team that could help you know diversity in team composition in terms of gender uh, race ethnicity uh, and all these other things you know having individuals within the team that might be able to help you understand these cultures can assist in having those conversations and one of the main things I feel, and I think Suzanne's going to give you a really good example of how she's done this really well, is developing a long term relationship with these communities. So not just taking what you need, collecting their stories, going on and doing your research and basically publishing and never talking about them or to them again. You know, that is where the trust is being uh, damaged, I feel, you know, you need to be able to find ways that you can have that long term relationship and find ways that you can help their lives and, you know, they're in whatever, you know, sort of stories that they've shared with you, even through the exploratory phase of building that relationship. And I think that's really, really important. Um, I mean, there's many things, you know, self sort of reflection, thinking of um, sort of biases that you might have talking through them you know, cultural competency is essential as well, you know, making sure that you understand the different cultures of these communities that you're trying to engage with. Um, something that I, I, I love uh, sort of putting out there is if you're culturally competent, you'll be able to assess whether these people are hard to reach 
or more likely are they easy to ignore you know because you'll be able to understand where they're coming from you know what are some of these struggles you know what what is it that is 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 preventing them and a lot of the times you know as researchers we put these blocks in ourselves yeah yeah that's really important like for researchers to hear like you know all this all these things they should be considering and what more they can be doing so yeah thank you thank you for taking us through that uh, and as you mentioned yeah Suze is probably a good person to come to next um to sort of see an example of maybe how this can be achieved so uh Suze, uh, could you please tell us more about uh, BRAG and how this collaboration was formed? Yeah, sure. Um, I, uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about this, actually. And well done, Vinish. It's great to hear your voice on this. Um, it's such an important angle to, to encourage people to be feel more comfortable about discussing. Um, so BRAG is a research advisory group. Um, they are part and facilitated by an organisation called uh, VOCAL who work towards um, bringing people and health researchers together. And BRAG um, represent, or they, they are members of diverse communities across Greater Manchester, including the Chinese community, Bangladeshi community, and Pakistani community. And they're all community leaders in their own right. They're very articulate and they're very passionate about helping to um, educate and shape research. So they, they're really invested in trying to um, make sure that their communities are represented in those research practices and they are they are a huge asset. Um, so I met Bragg via um, a forum that I'm part of. So I work within the Division of Cancer Sciences. So cancer is my remit. Um, and we have a PPIE cancer forum. Um, and so we meet quite regularly with um, partners across the Manchester Cancer Research Centre. Um, to really share best practice around the activities that we create, um, but also discuss the challenges in, in, in setting up those activities. And often that is about reaching the right communities and making those steps towards um, engaging them and bringing them into um, our research building to make it more familiar. Um, so I wanted to set something up for World Cancer Day, which um, was literally just before lockdown. So February 2020, we managed to, to stage this event and Bragg helped to co-create that event. Um, and we had a, a fantastic panel discussion at the end, exactly what Benish, Benish has just um, described. Um, Bragg will sit there and say, you know, we are not hard to reach. It's about investing the time in creating some trust some safe space to have those conversations, to have those open conversations about what's missing in the research we're doing. Hold up that mirror to everybody and say, look, I'm not looking at this because it's not my history. I don't understand it and therefore I don't need to know about it. It's not the case. We all need to be a lot more aware and a lot more open to having those discussions. And groups like Bragg are, are amazing to, for, you know, to really facilitate those, those conversations. Yeah, that sounds like amazing, uh, an amazing collaboration um, that you've got there. And uh, especially, you know, what you said about, you know, we are here, you know, we're not hard to reach. Um, is there anything else that um, sort of you've learned from Bragg so far uh, in terms of tackling cancer disparities um, within Greater Manchester? So, yeah, well, I mean, I would say that I learn from Bragg every time I talk to them. <laughs> I can imagine. I yeah. say is, you know, I come away with a level of frustration, if I'm perfectly honest, because there's conversations I'll have with them where they say, we've been talking about this for 30 years. And you're just like, I think there needs to be a shift in um, the movement towards really investing in the engagement process, recognizing how important it is to build those authentic relationships and have that long-term commitment. Maintaining it is quite difficult, maintaining the momentum. If you think about uh, applying for research, for example, a research funding, you have to think of your proposal, you come up with your research question, you write your application, um, you, you know, you submit it, you have to wait for the result. That's a long process. So, you know, I'm really keen for funders um, and researchers to be more aware of that, that time frame and more willing to say, no, hang on, we need more time to invest in this part, because that's the only way that we're going to create that equal partnership, which is actually really, you know, the key part of um, establishing a relationship where you can have that reciprocal learning. You know, we, we're, we're talking to these community members because we want to learn what it is that they're missing out on. Why aren't they engaging in cancer screening? 
Why are they, um, you know, not able to understand the risks of, of developing cancer or what, you know, whatever the aspect is, we need to learn from them in order for us to, to be able to educate and to improve the services across the board. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, that sounds like fantastic work. Um, and so in terms of sort of tackling those disparities, you know, encouraging a wider population to sort of get involved with cancer screening, stuff like that. Um, what else is the kind of uh, vision for the future of this collaboration? Um, are there any sort of specific uh, action points that you'll be taking? Yeah, so I mean, there are so many opportunities for improvement all the way across for in, in my context for the cancer continuum, you know, all the way from raising awareness and education through to um, educating our researchers that they need to, to take the responsibility to ensure that the samples that they're using in the lab, for example, represent the population that they're trying to study. So if they're looking at um, prostate cancers, for example, they don't just use the pan-European cell lines that are available to them in every repository, but maybe consider, you know, setting up a project whereby they will engage people to, to donate the, the correct samples to generate new models, which are far more accurate and much more representative of the, of the cancers they're trying to study. Um, but there's also other options, you know, there's the, the language that's used within consultancy with the primary care, whether that's the GP or the uh, pharmacist, for example. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a number of different um, angles that can be taken and, and it's through conversation and this, this event for you guys, fantastic work. It's great to have this opportunity to open up this dialogue because this is how we will, we will make that, uh, that meaningful change. Great. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, it uh, sounds like there's a lot, a lot of work to start um, to be doing in that area. So thank you very much for uh, telling us about that. Um, and for sort of highlighting how research benefits from uh, diverse inclusion, uh, and actually, you know, consulting these populations and how the research is done. So I guess that leads us into some of Ellen's work uh, with inclusion of individuals with uh, Parkinson's disease for collaboration and consulting. So um, Ellen, could you tell us about your experience from this collaboration and what's been the impact on your research personally and also sort of greater impact of patient or public involvement in research as a whole? Um, so a little bit like um, Sheena's story um, through getting involved working with people with Parkinson's has led to a more translational angle for my research. So um, the first time this happened, actually, I went to talk about my research to a local Parkinson's group and they said, oh, um, we've set up some gym training, which we think is helping our symptoms. You ought to come and research that. And um, that led to a small project and my first experience of doing a kind of mini clinical trial. And it was very motivating um, taking part um, in that research. And it was the first time that um, a participant had written a poem about their experience, which I viewed as a, a sign of success. Um, but then, um, um, more recently, um, we've set up, um, although it's still a number of years ago now, but we started looking at imitation of movement and whether that could be used um, or whether people with Parkinson's could still use imitation to move more effectively. And I'm really pleased to see that um, Matthew Sullivan, my collaborator on this project or a number of related projects is here in the audience. Um, but that had a huge impact on, on the project. So um, to begin with, um, we, you, we work together more in terms of shaping because we are measuring behavior of people with Parkinson's in the lab. It's really important that we make the instructions accessible. We make the whole session um, easy and accessible for people. So Matthew usually jokes that he comes and has a go at the experiment and just tells um, the research they ought to provide more cups of tea for the participants. But really his insights are much greater than that and he really helps um, um, new students and researchers think about the session from the perspective of the participants. And not only does that mean we get better data, it means that the experience for the participant is much better and we build up a much um, closer relationship with our participants who come back to the lab on, on numerous occasions. Um, but more importantly, working with Matthew, and we also were fortunate to work with um, one of our undergraduate students, who was one of the youngest people in the country to have Parkinson's, worked with us on his project. 
and having their input really helped us think about the application of imitation so they advised us and had input into developing an intervention and I think that wouldn't have happened in the same way at all um, without their without their input. I think it's also um, particularly useful having those kind of conversations um, particularly when you start researching a new area so um, um, we had a recent project starting to look at um, a new topic to me looking at um, issues with control of behavior and gambling in Parkinson's and we had focus groups on what is, is quite a sensitive topic but people sharing their stories and describing their experiences really helped us to think about that research in a different way and it's nice to see now that um, as researchers come and join us it's just kind of the way that we do it is that we do involvement and that's just they don't think it's anything special because it's just built into the process um, and that's really exciting to me and I hope that um, more and more research groups will sort of take that on as part of the the ethos sorry I've been rambling rather uh, I could talk for an hour on this topic I think um, but just to finish to say that um, it's um, I work um, with Parkinson's UK on their involvement steering group. So um, alongside Matthew, who's also in, um, in the audience, um, but we're looking to encourage both researchers and people with Parkinson's to do more involvement. So the charity provide training for both people with Parkinson's and researchers to try and facilitate that. Nice. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. And you definitely have not been rambling. It's really great to hear um, some of this like inclusive work that you're doing. Um, and I, I mean, it sounds like you've been involved in a number of sort of uh, projects uh, with public involvement and outreach projects, um, both sort of with Parkinson's and in general. So, I mean, you touched upon sort of building um, long term relationships um, and sort of different ways of engaging um, the public in a sort of more long-term way but what do you think are the most effective ways in sort of initially bringing the public in or engaging them in your lab's research um i think there's it depends really on the aim um so like um like Sheena, I've also done work um, engaging school children and actually it was nice to, the brain bus was something that I was also involved in in setting up so it's good to hear that that um, influenced um, the worm wagon. Um, so I would say it depends what you're trying to do so at just an initial workshop or activity that inspires um, school children to think more about a topic is is really important. Um, I think a nice example um, of um, similar things being used in, in different ways is um, we worked with the with Art Gallery um, a few years ago. They had an installation from the Siobhan Davis Dance Company and um, we worked with um, to deliver uh, some primary school sessions. Um, so we interested, hopefully, um, children in um, imitation and movement and how the brain works. And we worked with some um, dance um, teachers to deliver. Luckily, I didn't have to teach the, the dance part, just <laughs> the, the brain part. Um, so it was really nice that we had the, the children were there in one area and then went to look around the installation. But also we were looking at the potential benefits of dance for people with Parkinson's. So we had a group of people who came to look around the exhibition and then we sat and talked to them in the cafe afterwards and they shared their thoughts and sort of used the exhibition as a kind of stimulus to to reflect upon what they what their benefits might be or how they respond to seeing people move and um, the sort of bodily sensations so that's quite a nice example of how the same sort of scenario can give rise to quite different outcomes but both hopefully um quite meaningful yeah definitely yeah it's really interesting to hear um sort of projects connecting science and the arts it sounds like there's uh, definitely sort of a lot of benefits that a lot of researchers might not have considered so thank you very much for um talking us through some of that so i think i'll open up to some more general questions now uh, and questions from the audience so for our audience members, uh, please use the Zoom chat function to enter your questions. Um, and to our panel members, please feel free to jump in whenever. So uh, I'll just check with uh, Josh. Do we have any questions so far? 
Yes. Um, so we do have a question. Am I very loud? No, you're good. Okay, oh, good. Me anyway. um, so one of our audience members has asked, is there any details about how BRAG was set up? Um, all the cities don't have organisations like this. So I guess this is directed to Suze. Um, hi, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, BRAG is, is definitely a unique setup. They have a longevity with them. Um, which is which is fantastic, and all credit needs to go to Vocal on that. Um, this these were a fully formed a research advisory group when I when I first encountered them. So I would uh, signpost Vocal, which is wearevocal.com, I believe. Um, I'm sure we can put that in a in a follow up message. Yeah, definitely. I'm sure we can do that. What I would um, just add to that, and it and it follows on from something that Ellen was saying, is that you know finding a way to engage communities. For me, I think it's about identifying those community um, anchors or the trusted voices within those communities to help you sort of, um, you know, build up those relationships initially. Because once you once you sort of have um, that initial person that you can kind of gain that trust with, then you can almost have that ripple effect where where that sort of um, increases within that community as well. And that 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 sort of um, method really helps to engage the, the the wider community. Yeah, and can I just add that um, when you do have those uh, relationships with those community members, um, they will help you um, find ways, find the best inclusive language to uh, connect with the community that you're trying to connect with and know how they want to receive the information. So really, really keep that relationship going and strong and make sure that you don't lose touch with those people that you initially did or were able to recruit or were, in, you know, just generally anchors in the community that do engage uh, and help researchers get in touch with community members. I also just add as well, um, for me, there's been some other different ways that I've been able to enter diverse communities. So one is through ESOL lessons. ESOL lessons are happening across all parts of the UK, probably not in Highlands where I'm from, <laughs> but they, the English teachers will know the, the students and know what the students want and having a partnership, getting involved with partnership like that has been fantastic for me because I've been able to connect with all sorts of diverse people. Also, sometimes through the council, um, I'm doing work in Brunswick at the moment, um, which is an area adjacent to the university. There's a fantastic partnership that we've developed um, through a kind of one of those key anchor people, um, Sharon, who's been working with the university for a long time. She knows everybody in the community. So she's connected us within that community. So she's helped us get in and even um, learned organizations also I'm part of UK kick which is the UK COVID immunology consortium we've got a fantastic and diverse UK wide patient advisory board um, and I think that's that's really valuable so there's lots of different ways if you don't happen to be near Manchester um, and you know and you don't you don't have access to vocal you don't um, so there are loads and loads of good ways to do it and always be clear what the partnership is about find out from the from the group what they want and be clear about what you can offer because sometimes you might have find that funding but if you've been honest about it then you won't be letting people down if it doesn't last forever great that's really good advice thank you and hopefully um, these sorts of collaborations will spread to the highlands and <laughs> over the next two years and further afield than that um, josh are there any more questions If not, then um, I mean, I assume there'll be quite a few. Yeah, sorry. Oh, there are, sorry. Um, <laughs> we've got a question. How can the public be of help to, in engaging diverse communities? So how can the public be of help uh, in engaging diverse communities? So I suppose anyone can jump in for that one. Um, yeah, I, I think um, one of the things that I've been involved with uh, through the British Society for Immunology 
is a, a big campaign to get everybody act, being, feeling that they can act as vaccine ambassadors to talk about what vaccination is, to talk about the pros and cons of it. And well, there isn't much cons, but anyway, talk about it. And we've what we've tried to do is create a suite of, of resources. We're trying to encourage people to start doing it from home with their friends, with their community. But again, through UK Kick, that's allowing us a wider set of areas. What's fantastic chap in, in Birmingham, Tony, he's always telling us about um he, he's from a, a Caribbean background, so he's always telling us about you know his community and all the people he engages with so there is this sort of uh, ripple effect and at the moment we're just getting a lot of our resources translated into lots of different languages so they can have even more utility and in Manchester we've got the um ah, I've just forgot multilingual Manchester so connecting with multilingual Manchester has been really really helpful so that's that's one example so that can show you how all sorts of diverse people can get involved Right. Cool. That's cool. Great. I've, I've got an example to share. So um, in one of our projects, um, we worked with WAST Women Asylum Seekers together and a choreographer and um, they came to visit our lab and then put together a dance performance inspired by our work on imitation. And um, what they created was a much more interesting and exciting sort of look at what we do through their eyes rather than sort of our idea of how to um of how to sort of communicate that so just a very simple idea we um we put magnetic markers on people to measure their movements and they used just glow sticks and turned down the light to look at movements and those kind of things were extremely effective and it was great to see as well that they also shared different dances from the different cultures and built sort of imitation and sharing of that into into the piece. Wow that's brilliant is there any way that any of our audience members could see any of those dances or are they? Um, I, I'll have to see if yeah. I can dig out um, there's a, a video clip I might be able to put in the chat if I can find it quickly enough. Oh, well, don't worry if uh, we have, I'm sure we could uh, sort of tweet it out at some point. But yeah, that sounds really interesting, really fascinating. Um, so sort of like, like I say, connecting dance with science, like who, who wouldn't love that? So, um, I mean, if no one else wants to jump in on that, uh, do we want, uh, are there any, any more questions, Josh? Um, yes, we've got a question. What do you feel has been your biggest learning moment from public engagement with research? Okay, so your biggest learning moment from public engagement with research. So I don't know if anyone has any sort of specific uh, experiences or moments they want to share. I'm going to, I'm going to just say quite a general thing, I think, yeah. which is that um, you realise that you know a lot more than you think you did, and also that you don't know enough, <laughs> all at the same time. Yeah, I can understand that. <laughs> Um, I mean, I've had so many, I, I think, listen, you've always got to listen to what the community you're working with want. Um, and I remember um, we were doing some, um, we've been doing some workshops in Longsight um, with a group of ladies called, um, in, oh, God, what are they called again? It, it, inspiring something, I've just blanked on the name, I'm being very, very stupid. And we had this idea from having done some workshops and what we needed to do because they were all mums and we've been bonding over being mums so that inter intersectionality that you were talking about and um we said right what we think we'd like to do um what do you think about this we said we'd like to do some workshops where we do some things with your children and you and your children do these activities together and we just got this, this sea of like what yeah no we don't want to do that we want you to work with our children we want you to work with us can we do it separately please and i felt like such a fool um and it, it just it was just like okay well that's it that's the last time i ever walk in with a completely preconceived idea because i was wrong and thank goodness i didn't go any further with it <laughs> well i'm sure i'm wondering if there are any mums in our audience who can relate to that <laughs> that's good advice as well <laughs> 
But I think that describes the perfect example, doesn't it? It's the perfect scenario where you, you know, as a researcher, you come up with these questions and you think you know exactly what you need to do to answer them. And it's only through that groundwork, through those starting conversations that you can really learn from the audience that you're trying to engage with. And often you do find yourself, actually, that's really not going to work, is it? But then equally during those conversations, if you co-develop something and you co-create something together, then that's how you best understand how that reciprocal sort of relationship can pan out. So, yeah. Yeah. And it's like a positive feedback loop, isn't it? Absolutely. You know, their input's only going to make your research better as well. So absolutely. You just have to be open to um, admitting that you're wrong. <laughs> and that, you know, at the end of the day, I'm coming here with an idea, but I, I could be completely off track tell me about what you think and let's work mm. together yeah I think one thing I would say is when you do get that time when you have recruited people from diverse communities value their time and experiences uh you know with the conditional issue that you're trying to uh research because but also keep in mind that the historical trauma uh, that underserved communities have experienced engaging in research uh, or other things and be aware of that, that this might surface during uh, your work together and be prepared to have some sort of support or resources ready uh, to give them that support if they need it. So really, really be careful, you know, understand the situations that might, different people might bring with them and, you know, be ready to offer them whatever you can to help them through the process of research, because it's not easy. It's not easy for a lot of people. Um, and yes, you know, the first step is to be involved, but then it's that relationship that you're building, that trust that you're building. And once you build that trust and you're, you're sort of in the door, you know that it's, it is a responsibility in a way, you know, that you keep that going and you know that relationship is is really really uh, authentic and you know you can offer as much as you as you can definitely and I mean, if we've learned anything like public uh, or diverse public involvement in research is valuable to research like why shouldn't we um make make it sort of well known how valuable these people's time and effort and is equally think about what what would what would reimbursement be for that community with inspired ladies, I thought it was going to be, well, we're going to we're going to provide lots of food and we're going to do all these things. No, they wanted to feed us and bring all the national dishes. I mean, it was a feast. It was brilliant. It, not my expectation. Um, another group that I'm working with a lot at the moment is a lot of people who are taking um, universal credit. Um, they don't want paid, but they want shopping vouchers and they want additional skills. So what skills could we offer those community members that would be valuable? And so, you know, we had to kind of repurpose because we, we costed in that we were going to pay so much for participation and actually that wasn't, wasn't what wanted. So again, listening. Yeah, just keeping those lines of communication open, so important. Mm. I, I was going to make a, a slightly different point, which was, um, although maybe it chimes a bit with that, but sort of not, not necessarily knowing what to expect or what the the benefits would be so that's something that um matthew and i have talked about in terms of the evolving collaboration that we've had around um research but um just to give an example that um the project i mentioned with um the women of science seekers around dance um i i i can't even quite think how it all evolved but actually the researcher who worked with me on that then it was her leadership and seeing the link between Parkinson's and dance that led on to us doing that so although that wasn't what we anticipated would come out of that project that that spark those ideas those led to to research that wouldn't otherwise have happened so I think going in with a kind of open-mindedness and perhaps that's something perhaps that as scientists we can struggle with not controlling or knowing what we're what we're going into um is is very precious and important part of the process yeah definitely I think that's good advice for any scientist that might be on the call <laughs> Yeah, always be willing to keep learning. I mean, that's the beauty of science, isn't it? You just, you can never fully understand how um, an, an experiment or any kind of uh, public participation will pan out. So yeah, great advice uh, from everyone there just to sort of listen and keep open-minded. Um, great, so uh, this is from a researcher in genetics who feels um, the field uh, is particularly bad at excluding groups of participants as routine methodology. 
to study homogenous groups, which are almost always white. So how can we better encourage funders and study designers to incorporate more diverse groups into project rationale? And they've also said that they sometimes despair and the volume of literature that claims to stratify patients effectively for genetic risk, but haven't included anyone who doesn't identify as white. So the question there was, how can we better encourage funders and study designers to include and incorporate more diverse groups into the project? Uh, demand it. <laughs> it, talk about it. 90% um, of the cell lines are white or European. So the data, the, the accessible um, material that the majority of, of uh, experiments are performed on um, don't represent the, the communities that we're trying to engage. So, and the, you know, this is a historical backlog, essentially. So it's about awareness. It's about um, encouraging people to come forward and develop new models to donate samples to be part of research projects they, it is absolutely essential that right now these are exactly the things that we're addressing um, if covid has shown anything it is this health equality or health inequality that's that's emerged and it is really is the time to to start talking about it and doing something about it definitely yeah yeah, absolutely right with COVID. It's been a big mirror on the sort of massive flaws that science has with inclusion and diverse. Um, absolutely. But the new, the new technology that's coming in, talking from a genetics point of view, the new technology that's coming about is will enable us to look for genetic ancestry as well within the genome. So there, there are in the future, there are going to be ways of having internal controls, for example, um, across your samples, to, to you know, sort of pull out the, the heritage, pull out the ethnicity. Um, so again, that, that um, means that you don't necessarily have to self-report because there are a lot, if you read anything about the Human Genome Project and a lot of the research that's gone on um, with people who've submitted samples with that, um, you know, there's, there's family stories where there are skeletons in cupboards, etc. So people's knowledge of what their family history is, isn't always accurate anyway. So there's an awful lot of stuff that can can come out of just having these conversations and being open about it. Mm, definitely. Great. So I think we have time for sort of one last big question, which is, is the scientific research community itself a representative or diverse group? So if not, what can be done to encourage diversity? So I guess that's focusing more on the researchers themselves rather than participants <laughs> we heard will sort of influence the latter. I mean, I've obviously, you know, been at many different places doing research in many different institutions and I often find myself being either the only or one of two or three people that are from a diverse background and um, it is sad. It's sad because I don't know if it's down to people not applying for those jobs or if it's other things going on that um, you know there's not enough of us in 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 communities and i'm here i'm sorry in research uh, teams and i'm here today obviously talking about these issues and i've not had to do too much digging around or had to do you know much research on this it's just because it's internal it's something i've grown up with it's something i've learned and it's something i can put across academically now and i've obviously had chats with suzanne and i've learned what it means to build that trust within academia within research and the importance of being involved in research for people, but it definitely is something that needs to be um, sort of highlighted and you know really discussed and uh, something that, you know that is important, really really important to have more people, more diverse people within your teams. And like I said, if you have that, then you can come together and work as a team and learn about different cultures, learn about how to be culturally competent, know what's important, what's a taboo area what you know sort of stigmas are that attached to certain things definitely mm, yeah and it's only going to in the end so i think there are a number of um proactive um sort of diversity strategies that you can put in place and it can happen at the individual level whether it's you know being an advisor or being a mentor or being a sponsor or recognizing that we all have that role to play to challenging status quo to ensure equity um, whether it's within um, the leaders that are, that are in whichever organisation, you know, encouraging people to walk the talk, 
being cons consistent and sort of non-ambiguous in the messaging and making sure that um, job adverts, for example, are as inclusive and the language is used as inclusive. Um, and also, you know, at the organisational level, it's creating those opportunities, isn't it? And, and reflecting and, and showing role models as much as possible. And that's across the board, whether it's gender, ethnicity, disability, you know, across the board, we need, we need to have um, a greater exposure of role models um, to, to ensure that diversity is improved. Mm, definitely. Thank you. So I know I said that was the last question, but another really interesting one has just come through. So. Can I just make a little point here, though? There is a certain irony us being asked that question as an all-female panel. <laughs> just gonna, I'm just putting that out there. <laughs> a lot of public engagement, a lot of admin roles, a lot of all these sorts of roles are done by women. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe that's also part of the problem. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. So this other question is, what do you think, and I guess this can go to everyone, what do you think we have learned from doing public engagement during the pandemic? <laughs> so, I mean, other than your sort of day-to-day -day Zoom <laughs> phrases that you might not have heard pre-pandemic, uh, is there any sort of aspects of maybe engaging the public or hosting events sort of maybe virtually that you think are effective or, or are you just really looking forward to going back to normal? <laughs> It's definitely been more challenging to do face-to-face -face events. Um, for me, it's made me think about um, kind of what I want to do and some of the, some of the tools that I have. As, a, as an immunologist who studies infection, I felt that one of the things that I could do would be to contribute that knowledge um, and try and tackle some of the misinformation and try and communicate sort of more widely and one of the things that I've done is I've started writing a lot so I've written a lot of, of sort of lay articles sort of explaining research and that's quite a new skill to me it wasn't one that I was doing a lot before it's been a real learning curve but that's been really useful and it's something I'm taking into my teaching it's I'm taking it into my my research and I know from my my work with UK Kick, for example, that it's something the PPIE panel really value. They really value getting those clear explanations of the research, being able to cut to the chase, know what's accurate, what's not. So it opens up a lot of conversations. So I think sometimes, although the, the other things have been challenging, it has opened up the opportunities to learn new skills. And we're all a lot more au fait. I mean, the community researchers I work with in Brunswick they're all going, yeah, no, we use Zoom now. We're, we're, it's fine. We can all use Zoom. And they're all feeling more technically kind of comfortable now. So they even had a go at playing around with some air quality monitors, which they would have been terrified about. Um, and so this is their words a few months ago. Um, so it's given people some confidence. Mm, yeah, I imagine that would have been sort of a, maybe more towards the beginning of the pandemic, a huge issue with, you know, people who are comfortable with technology and people who aren't like, so getting to all those groups must be sort of a big thing that COVID has really shone a light on. Um, okay, uh, just to close up our discussion, um, just to each of our panel members, if we can sort of keep this to maybe one sentence, if you could say one thing to encourage someone to get involved in research in any way, so any way that you might be uh, an expert in, what would it be? Um, and I hope this doesn't put too much pressure on people, but uh, if, if I can come around to each of you, uh, maybe Sheena, if we come to you first, if you could say one thing to encourage someone to get involved in research. Start with your friends and family. Start at home. Sure. You are that <laughs> and trusted voice. Nice. Uh, and Vinish? I would just say, you know, that People want to learn. People want to learn about these amazing, beautiful cultures and beliefs that we all live with in the UK, especially, you know, there's such a diverse out, diversity out there and just come forward and share your stories because we want to know, you know, we want to learn more and uh, sort of build that relationship. So definitely just uh, be open as much as you can. Great. Thank you. Uh, Suze, if we come to you next. So I would say that, you know, the purpose of research is to explore, explain and improve. Um, and it's essential that our entire population is represented in all of our research. Great, thank you. And Ellen, any final thoughts? Um, that I guess um, to share ideas and thoughts and anecdotes because they might make their way into our next research project and 
next question. Nice. Yeah, I'm sure people do a lot of the time don't even understand the value that their words and experiences have. So great. Well, thank you all so much. So uh, as we draw this panel discussion to a close, I would like to invite our audience members to once again answer the poll questions, which should be appearing on your screen now. Um, so we've heard all about how the public can hugely benefit research, but I mean, as we touched upon here as well, how might getting involved in research also benefit the public? Um, and Live with Scientists in collaboration with Autism at Manchester will be hosting a follow-on panel uh, next week to focus on the impact of community involvement in research on the community itself. So you can join us next Tuesday, the 27th of April at 6 30 to hear members of Autism at Manchester discuss the importance of representation in research and who research is really for. Uh, and if you are interested in more of what Live with Scientists has to offer, particularly during the rest of our anniversary month, uh, you can join us for our um, science themed pub quiz this Friday evening, or you can check out some of our uh, podcast activity recommendations we've been tweeting and sharing on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, and also some of the wonderful research from uh, postgraduate scientists that we've been promoting as well through competition. So follow us on Twitter, Instagram, like our Facebook page or sign up to our mailing list for updates on events and things you can get involved in, um, which really just help to make science accessible for everyone. And that's the key aim here and hopefully something that this panel event has really worked towards. So. For now, I just want to give a huge thank you to our speakers for joining us this evening and sharing their insights. It's really been a fantastic discussion. And thank you, of course, to all of our audience members for your fantastic questions as well, uh, and for joining us this evening. Uh, and just quickly looking at the poll results. Uh, so it looks, I mean, I can't really remember the results from the beginning, to be honest, but we'll have uh, our team look through these properly a bit later, but it does look like a lot more people would be open to being involved in scientific research. And I think the third question, how important do you think non-scientists are in scientific research has now jumped up to 100% of people saying essential. So that's great to hear. So thank you very much for answering those. And once again, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, it's been great to see you all here. Uh, and we really hope to see you again soon at future events. So take care everybody and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. I'll bring this panel discussion to a close. Well done everybody, fantastic. Thank you. Take care. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Nice to meet you all again. Yeah, great to see you. Bye. Bye. Bye.